Yo, this is Pete Town's finest, representing the NEP. D. Stoudemire, and y'all know what we're talking about. No one's ready to deal with us. Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to another edition of the Rip City Report. The 100th, 100th edition, edition of the Rip City Report. I am Joe Freeman of the Oregonian. He is Casey Holdall of Trailblazers.com. Greetings, everybody, uh, and greetings, Joe. Greetings to all of you for the 100th time. Yeah, and thank you. Yes, really. thank you very thank much, you. everyone, for listening. And yes. yeah, we we probably wouldn't have kept going if people hadn't been listening. So, uh, so if you do like the podcast, uh, pat yourself on the back yes. because give, you're the reason why it's still going. Give yourself a round of applause. Yeah. We, I mean, we enjoy it, but we do it for you, and it's the only reason it exists is because of you. If, like Casey said, if it if it wasn't well received, it wouldn't be received. So, kudos to you. Thank yes, you. thank you everybody for listening. We really appreciate it, and we'll do something larger at some other point in time. It's just too hard here on the uh, the precipice of the 2017 NBA playoffs to to really put the focus on us and yeah. the uh, and the show when really the emphasis needs to be on the first round series versus the Portland Trailblazers and the Golden State Warriors. As much as our egos would like for us to sit here and just talk nonstop, no, about that's not. Neither uh, we have no ego, Joe. I I'm, I appreciate you your self deprecation here, but I'm I'm just gonna let you guys know that Joe has no ego whatsoever. We all have ego. Well, yeah, not not, not yeah. whatsoever. Comparatively very, speaking, very little. Though, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it is our 100th episode, so and it's your 100th episode, so thank you. And it is April 13th, which means, I don't know if it really means this, but it does mean that it is the playoffs. Congratulations. Yes. You made it. It's been a long haul. Uh, two months ago, you didn't think you'd be here. Admit it. There's going to be some never doubt shirts roaming around the Moda Center. Some people saying they never doubted, but you doubted. Rightfully so. 11 games under 500 at the All-Star break. Now here we are, Blazers close red hot, get to 500 on the season, get to the playoffs. So uh, so you enjoy this, however long it lasts, soak it in. Um, maybe Yusuf Nurkic will get back, maybe he won't. We'll maybe. find out in a couple of days. We'll get into that more in the podcast. Before we get too deep, though, uh, he is Casey Hold on. You can follow him on Twitter at Hold at C-H-O-L-D. And you can uh, read his stuff at blazers.com slash forward center. Thank you. And Yes. And I would encourage you to do so. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Blazer Freeman. And you can read my stuff and my colleague's stuff at organlive.com slash blazers. And, of course, if you subscribe to the podcast, review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or your various downloading SoundCloud. Devices. SoundCloud. Uh, YouTube. Boombox. Boombox. AM, Something FM radio. We should just make up right now. crappy shower radio that... I have it in my house that always goes out after like three days, yeah. and you can't understand what the lady is saying. Do you use it every day? My wife does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember my sister had a had one of those. Uh, I I never had one. I I would have liked to. I mean, I would like to listen to music in the shower. Yeah. I mean, I just listen to news. I I bought it because we had like an old you know radio one that worked fantastic. But I was like, oh, you know, this one has Bluetooth. It's this will be great. It's made for it's, the shower. It's, it's crap. It's one of the. It's one of those things where it's like the. The new iterations are a severe. They're they're much Downgrade. worse exactly than than what it was replacing. So don't don't replace your old shower uh, radios, folks. Keep them. Hold on to them tight. I mean, as the idiom goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, it was like a a shower radio that someone had given us like ten years before, and it well, still worked. Boy, imagine what that radio has seen. Yeah, that's a good. Ooh, yeah, that's a good point, Joe. Who Hopefully knows what's in there? Exactly. Maybe like an anti-cam the, up the spies in there or something. And the the viruses and and the hackings. Yeah. Did you knows? ever hear any Morse code on it? Uh only when you get your cell phone too close to it. You know, beep beep. Uh yeah, so as Casey alluded to, we're not gonna make a big deal out of one hundred, but we are gonna surprise you down the road and do something ridiculous at another point where we recognize uh thing so let's just get right into the playoffs which is what you guys want to talk about i know you guys are all jacked so uh we'll get first into news and notes the blazers ended the regular season with a 103 100 loss to the new orleans pelicans on wednesday night at the moda center ending the year with a 41 and 41 record the blazers went 17 and 6 in march and april to get to that 500 mark on the season portland of course will face the golden state warriors in the playoffs Game one, as just announced last night, is Sunday at 12.30 on ABC, a nice little afternoon special. Yeah. And then game two is Wednesday at 7.30 on TNT. Can you remember the last time the Blazers played at 12.30? Yes, it game? was against Golden State in game one of their series last time. All right. 
I, I, I assumed it was probably last year in the playoffs, but I, I couldn't I couldn't recall. Yeah. So uh and then after game one, again on Sunday, game two again on Wednesday. Could you drag it out any longer, NBA? <laughs> the series finally returns to Portland for game three on Saturday, nine days from now. I say that with great disdain. Make of it what you will. Couple of injury notes. Uh, Alan Crabb missed the last three games of the season with a sore foot, but he has said multiple times in multiple different ways to multiple different people he will play in the postseason. So expect him in uniform and ready to play in game one, although he has been walking around with a walking boot. Yeah. No, I mean, that, it's a real injury. Yeah. It, it, that's not a, eh, I just don't want to play. No, I mean, he, his foot's actually injured, um, and he's already said, you know, yeah, it's it's going to hurt. I'm going to play with pain, and, and that's that. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's good that they're trying to, to mitigate the issues that he's been having by sitting him for about a week, but, but I mean, he's going to play, and it's it's injured. Yeah. That's the way it is in the end of the season. Everyone's I guess injured. it's inflammation of some inflammation kind? Inflammation is what, is what they said. I'm not yeah. sure what is inflamed, but something in there is. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And with feet, too, it's it's tough. It's hard to tell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then finally, Yusuf Nurkic went through another light pregame workout before Wednesday's game. Uh, as far as we know, that's the second time he's done it before a game, and he also did it at Tuesday's practice as well. So uh, he's sort of making progress there. And the team is expected to announce his playoff availability availability on friday so stay tuned for that uh via our twitter feeds which we previously announced and our websites which we previously announced yeah they are going to have practice tomorrow uh practice 10 ish uh supposedly open to media at around twelve forty-five. so one would hope that uh sometime around twelve forty-five tomorrow uh, if not sooner we will have some kind of uh update or idea about nurkic's uh, availability i have been trying to get somebody to tell me a day for a very long time. Uh, uh, I don't know, three, two, three games ago, a pregame availability, I asked Terry, what day is Nurkic supposed to be reevaluated? He said, I don't know, whatever the two-week timeline is. And I'm like, okay. And then later on, I, I start to look at that, and I'm like, well, is it the two weeks from when he hurt himself? Is it the two weeks from when he started missing games? Or is it from the two weeks when the team announced that he would miss the rest of the regular season? Because all three of those things are different days. Finally, I settled on when they released it, which would have been tomorrow. And then I was kind of in a bad mood, and I was grumping about it. Yesterday, pregame in the media room, and Kerry Eggers uh, of the Portland Tribune sort of <laughs> got involved with me, and he was like, yes, this is ridiculous. And then, uh, fortunately, my uh, grimacing behind the scenes uh, precipitated Terry to ask again, or excuse me, Kerry to ask Terry again pregame yesterday, at which Terry... Terry told Kerry and the rest of us that, uh, how about I just tell you Friday? Is that a deal? Good, on Friday. Okay. And so then, there you go. Friday. Okay. So which you can would be two weeks from when the press release came out. True. Which was my assumption. My assumption is if it's in the press release and it says Nurkic will be reevaluated in two weeks, it is two weeks from when they sent that press release. Fair enough. I, th I think, I mean, I understand people being confused about it, but I, I'm, that seemed pretty obvious to me. I wish they would say something sooner than that. I, I agree on that, and I... You know, being more forthright is always, at least in our situation, better. But uh, I, I wasn't really confused. It's two weeks from when they send the release. I feel like when you're asked on Monday, which is in hindsight, I think, when I asked, hey, Terry, do you know what day this week Nurkic is supposed to be reevaluated? You know what day that will occur. Yeah, and to your point, yeah, punting it to, uh, uh, well, I don't know, whatever we said from that. I mean, I, I, I understand people wanting a more definitive, this is the date. Um and but I can also understand by reading the release when, in, in my opinion, when they're going yeah. to release that information. So anyway, the point of all this is not <laughs> just to hear me bitch and moan. It is also to it's, relay. That's good though. Usually, it's mostly my bitching and moaning. So it's <laughs> nice that someone else is getting someone in else on it. On. But it is a little insight into what we do behind the scenes to try to get you information. And I know how eager you guys are to get any inkling or any thread, any what, it, what sand crystal of information about your Nurkic and his availability and so trust me we are behind the scenes trying to get that for you and hopefully we'll all know more tomorrow with that said should we get right into talking about Yusuf and the playoffs uh, or should we wait and get into other stuff and get back we have a lot of questions let's let's get to let's talk more generally about the playoffs okay. first yeah cool well um how about we get into uh as you look at eight verse one in the history of the NBA playoffs 
an eight seed has upset a one seed five times. Uh, I believe three times in a best of seven scenario and twice in a best of five scenario. Uh, odds are not good. And the odds are particularly bad right now. Uh, and some of them have come out today, as far as I can tell. Uh, first up, from friend of the podcast Kevin Pelton of ESPN, he gives it a less than a 1% chance. Less than 1%. The Blazers beat the Warriors, and this is what he has to say. Portland was far better with Nurkic, who missed the team's final seven games of the regular season with a non-displaced fracture of his right fibula and is expected to be reevaluated prior to the start of the playoffs. And Nurkic starts, the Blazers went 14-5 and five with a plus 5.3 differential. Still not very good odds. No. Also, from Bovada, odds to win the title. Golden State has the best odds. Five and eight, five to eight. Excuse me, five two eight. I'll talk like a gambler. And the Blazers have the worst championship odds at three hundred to one. Similarly, Bookmaker.ed, their odds to win this series, the Trailblazers, and I don't totally understand this, are a plus twenty five hundred. I assume that's twenty five hundred to one. And the Golden State Warriors are a minus seven thousand, hmm. which I think means you need to pay seven thousand dollars to win one. Does that make sense? I think it's something to that. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's that much yeah. possibly but that, i think maybe that's the ratio I, I i only know how to bet lines like the when it when it's more like a serious thing i i don't know how to do that and yeah. obviously i do not gamble on basketball anyways so no um, disclaimer so i guess in the long run in the immortal words of lloyd christmas from dumb and dumber so you're telling me there's a chance yeah it's a small chance according to the statistics um you look at uh a lot of, and like so Pelton for instance uh, a lot of that dependent on point differential mm. and the Warriors having a, a 12 point something or rather point differential not only the best in the league this year but better than any other team by I think like five points uh, and the Blazers having a negative point differential those two things do not bode well for a team's chances uh, in terms of probabilities um, so not entirely surprising to see see that number uh, less than one percent to me seems I mean, like anything that has a possibility of happening within general reason, less than one percent seems really low to me. You know, <laughs> like I mean, it, it, I'm not saying they're going to win. I don't think they're going to win that series, but I don't think many people thought the Blazers were going to win the series last year. And granted, injuries occurred, but you you would think the chance of injuries even to to one of Stephen Curry or Kevin Durant or Draymond Green. Would be less, th- would be more than one percent. Ergo, you would think that that would improve that the odds of those guys getting injured would at least be the same as the odds of the Blazers winning the series. So I think his whatever his calculations are doesn't factor in injuries and potential. No, injuries no, and, and I'm sure it doesn't. But I, I just the idea of yeah. that, you know, there's so many things that can happen in a series to say that there's less than one percent chance. I mean, like what what other things would have a less than one percent chance of happening? You know, like it, it's got to be. I mean. I should have probably looked up something here to to give an example, but it, it seems to me that less. I mean, you'd think like three percent would be reasonable. Granted, it, it, it's still a very low percentage, but less than one percent is just that's like. I mean, that's not hitting the lottery or anything. I was going to say, yeah, it depends on the. Uh, I mean, these are. I looked it up. Slipping but, and falling in the shower, like. Uh, I I don't know. Getting hit by a bus. Hit by a, one uh, less than one percent chance seems about right for for bus hitting. Getting hit by a train, yeah, uh, you have I less that's even less, less interaction with trains. That's yeah. what I mean. So it's pro- oh right, yeah, uh, dying in a trip to space. Like, and I'm not saying those people who go to space, but all humans, but all human. Well, that's got to be pretty small because I mean, well, there's probably been what like a thousand people have been in space maybe Max, over the over wait, the Max, years. Yeah, I think that's high. Well, I mean, I'm even talking about you know even getting up into, you know, the, the stratosphere or yeah. whatever it's called. So uh, yeah. I realized also that I didn't read uh, Kevin. P- I, I only copied and pasted half of his thing, and I missed the most important part. <laughs> Here's what Kevin Pelton fully had to say. While the East's 1-8 to eight series might be close, the Blazers would need a historic upset to beat the Warriors, who posted the fourth-best differential in NBA history, plus 11.6. Mm, 11.6. Golden State also swept four head-to-head matchups against Portland, though all four games came before the Blazers added Yusuf Nurkic in a February trade. Interesting thing, and I'm going to actually write about this sometime over the next couple days as kind of a preview. Uh, The Blazers have two people on their team who were central figures or figures in an eight beating a one. Yeah. Evan Turner played for the uh, 
Philadelphia 76ers, who upset the Chicago Bulls in, I'm spacing on what year, I want to say it was 2007. That might be late. 2010. I probably should have that on top of my head, but I don't. Anyway, they uh, so he was a, a player in that series, a central player, and Terry Stotts was an assistant coach for the Seattle Supersonics team, who was the first team to fall to an eight seed. They were the one seed. Uh, they lost to the Denver Nuggets in that epic, memorable five-game series many years ago. So I spoke with them earlier this week kind of about you know their part in those series, what they remember, and then sort of to get an idea of what it takes for an eight to upset a one. Sure. And they both – Interestingly, he said a couple of the same things. Matchups, mm-hmm. immensely important. Uh, both talked about how the Sonics had like 65 wins, 67 wins that year, but two of the two of their losses were to were to uh, were to Denver. Mm-hmm. They went two and two against Denver, which, when you think of the odds, that's pretty high uh, considering how many games they lost that year. Uh, similarly, uh, Evan Turner said, I think he said the 76ers were two and two against the Bulls that year. Um, the Bulls were. Uh, were plagued a little bit by injuries. Uh, Derek Rose tore his ACL in game one. Joachim Noah hurt himself in game three. But Evan says, we went into that, and this is a similar thing. Uh, actually, Robert Pack, who was on the Denver Nuggets team that beat Terry's team, happened to be at the salad bar mm. in the media room when I was scooping my pregame meal last night. And uh, sort of we were talking to him back and forth. And he said, you know, we went into that series confident. We, we felt we could hang with them despite that. It's the same thing Evan Turner said, that the team felt good about its matchups, and they just had this confidence that they, they could and perhaps would win. Um, I sense a quiet confidence with this Blazers team, but that's just how they always are. Yeah. I, I do think you kind of set that stage if Nurkic is able to play. Because mm-hmm. I, I do think that I think that team feels like if we have Yusuf Nurkic on our team, we can we can play with anybody. And obviously having – play the Warriors last year I don't think the players look back on that series as I guess fondly as everyone else does in terms of like their performance uh I I think they look back yeah more on it with regret that they were up multiple uh, I think by double digits in in games well they got rolled in game one game two three four and five they held double digit leads in each yeah and so I I think they don't view that series like man we really gave them a a series it's more like man we really we blew a chance we 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 blew our our shot so I, I think the combination of that and and the way this team feels about their chances if Nurkic plays kind of puts them in that uh in that that headspace. Also, I just want to mention as well that one of the other you know one versus eight the we believe Warriors that beat the Dallas Mavericks in oh six oh seven or I guess technically oh seven. Uh, Damian Lillard obviously a fan of the team and and has mentioned that already. Uh, but a, a small tie in there is that so obviously the Mavericks got rid of their staff their coaching staff after they lost that series, uh, Rick Carlisle comes in. Terry Stotts becomes an assistant coach for the Dallas Mavericks that next season. So Terry Possibly m- due to them getting run in the 1-8 matchup. Indeed. Maybe Terry wouldn't be here right now if not for that. It's very possible. Uh, how things go around. Now, what do you think about the matchups in this series? It, I, I sort of look at Golden State as that they're kind of matchup proof. I don't know yeah. that anybody matches up well against them. No one does. The, because the only – well, and again, not, not to belabor the point too much, that the, the Warriors can play almost any, any style. And with the talent they have, particularly in their starting lineup, pretty much any team is going into that matchup at best having one or two – positions where they feel like they're they're better than the Warriors and probably that's even even probably an exaggeration uh we can go through here in a minute and kind of look at each matchup for the Blazers and again like when you're when you're a Warriors team that's been together for a couple years has been historically great has lost more games in the last three seasons or fewer games the last three seasons than the Blazers lost this season you you assume that that those matchups are not going to to benefit you and you know the initial look at is they they don't one thing that's, that I think is interesting, Evan Turner has uh, – I've spoken with him multiple times over the last few days about the Warriors in the matchup, and each time he, he likes to talk about how battle-tested they are. Mm-hmm. And it's a good point. I mean, they've every, – virtually everybody on their team has been through deep, deep playoff runs. Many have won championships. Durant hasn't, but he's played in the finals. So he's been through the fires uh, multiple, multiple times. But not only – are they battle tested? They're also hungry. Yeah. Because they had an epic collapse in the finals last year. And while Durant wasn't there, he's hungry for his first championship. So when you look at the combination of those guys who are trying to, you know, uh, 
I don't know, avenge last year's collapse, and then a guy who's trying to get his first championship while also dealing with the you know the negative connotations that went with him jumping ship to get to the Warriors to chase that championship. Um, I guess I guess when you look at it like that, it's not only a battle tested team but also a hungry team. Yeah, the Warriors are not casual, you know, like and, and they have. I mean, any kind of any team that has Draymond Green, particularly empowered as he has been empowered, is not going to be casual when it comes to to any game, let alone a series. To your point, Joe, let alone a series after they were embarrassed by losing the the finals after having a three one lead. So, uh, the idea that like the Blazers are going to be able to sneak up on the Warriors or anything like that is, I mean, that's that's Nonsense. completely out the yeah. window. So, yeah, I mean, they're going to come against a motivated team again, a team that that has had success against the Blazers. Granted, they never played versus Nurkic, and again, who knows if he's going to play either. And it's not necessarily fair to say, well, if you take out the 45-point loss that the Trailblazers had versus the Warriors this season, then this was what their their uh, their margin of victory was. But again, you, I mean, a 40-point 40, 40 or 45-point, whatever it was, loss will kind of throw off the numbers a bit. Yeah. And and that's not to say that the Warriors aren't great and should not be favored versus the Trailblazers because they 100% absolutely should be. But it again, you you, you got to sometimes you got to drill down a little bit further to see kind of what happened. And and you know, a game that you're already down 20 at that point, you lost, you know. So it's like 20 or 40, we'd rather not lose by 40, but a loss is a loss. So I don't know how much you put on that. I do think you have to consider how great the Warriors are though. So that's a that's gonna be tough sledding for the Portland Trailblazers, no doubt. Kevin Durant versus the Trailblazers in four games this season, twenty nine point three points per game, seven point eight rebounds per game, four point zero assists per game, two point zero steals per game, one point five blocks per game. He shot sixty percent from the field. How many and how many? I feel like he didn't even have to play a lot in those games. Too. Average thirty four minutes. 30, well, that's, under that's about average, but I, I I feel like in a couple games. I can't remember. It was one of the games in probably the first one in uh, second one in Oakland where I think it might have been the second one in Oakland where Blazers were semi close going into the third quarter. I think they were within like seven or something like that. And then within two minutes, they were down like 20. So and I and it was mostly whatever game it was where both Durant and Stephen Curry just basically anything they threw in the general vicinity of the basket went in. So, man, you look at these matchups and and you think. Damian Lillard is your best chance to have an edge in any matchup, in any game that you play in, in, in at any point. You look at where on the way, he's across the way, and he's facing an MVP, yeah. a former MVP. Uh, and then you go on down, you've got CJ, who's facing a multiple all-star, who just demolished the Blazers in the playoffs last year. Clay Thompson. With or without Steph, Clay Thompson. Uh, Draymond, arguably the most versatile player and defender I would say a leading contender, certainly a leading contender for Defensive Player of the Year this absolutely, season. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, a menace on both ends. You've got Kevin Durant. I mean, do you put Mo Harkless on him? Do you put Al Farouk Aminu on him? How do you handle a guy like that with all those other weapons? And then you got center where the Blazers don't even know yet who, or we don't know yet who they're playing uh, against Zaja Pachulia. And then you've got a bench. The Warriors, you look at their starters and you're like, well... That's tough. What about their bench? Andre Iguodala, probably the leading candidate for sixth man of the year. Well, Eric Gordon's going to get it because of scoring, but if, if I'm you were going to ask me I'm who's better, then I, I would take Iguodala. I, I, I'm voting for Iguodala. Uh, but, yeah, um, David West has been playing well, uh, and there's someone else I'm forgetting. Sean Livingston. Sean Livingston. Ian Clark has had big games Ian against Clark's the Blazers. Huge games against the Blazers this year. I mean, you just look at the matchups, and, and it's not – again, it's not just the Blazers. It's any team in the league is, is going to struggle in those head-to-head matchups. So – I just don't see where you have an edge. I, I mean, as the Blazers showed down the stretch, when Alan Crabb has a huge game, you, you can whatever game that was when they was it Utah? No, that was when Dame went nuts. What it was a bad team. Suns maybe. I don't know. AC had a big game. We saw it last year. Aminu last and, game he played. Whatever yeah, yeah, that was. Right. Aminu and Plumley huge games last year in the playoffs at different times to catapult the Blazers. And so you need someone like that to have an unexpected big performance to accentuate what your other guys do. And then I think you need that, and I think you need Damian Lillard playing out of his mind. Uh, those are the slim hopes you have to, 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 as Kevin Pelton said, register a historic upset. It was a cool – I can't even say it right. It was a Timberwolves game that uh, – Timberwolves. Alan, yeah. Uh, yeah, and when you look at those matchups, if Nurkic plays, again, a huge if, 
I think that's that's one spot where you say the Blazers have the advantage. But outside of that, yeah, you're exactly right, Joe. And I mean, and people have mentioned it. For the Blazers to have a shot in this one, they they're going to need to have both Damian and CJ be on 100 percent of the time and dialed in and putting up probably 30 30 plus to have a shot in this one and that's going to be tough the the Warriors too a fantastic defensive team uh I, I think might have been first in defensive efficiency this year second second behind the Spurs I behind believe. the Spurs uh you know they shut you down they get that smaller lineup with with Draymond at center uh that's going to be I mean that's tough for every team and even if Nurkic does play can you have him guarding Draymond on the perimeter I don't think so I mean, they again, like the, the the Warriors, and this typically happens with the teams that are better. They they force their style of play onto you, you know. Like, and, and there will be people that will have will play a couple games, and if the Blazers lose those games, particularly by a lot, there will be a lot of people that say, "Why aren't you trying to slow it down?" Versus the Warriors, plot it out. It, that does not work, you know. One, that's not the way the Blazers play, anyways. But two, the the Warriors can play any style, and you are not going to you're not going to muck the game up versus the Warriors, particularly in a 1-8 matchup where they're probably going to be calling the game pretty tight. Blazers already foul the heck out of teams anyways. You know, the, the idea that they're going to be able to to grind it out, I, I just don't see it. And not only that, they don't want to. No, they, they, they don't. They think that they have the most uh, likely chance to succeed by playing fast, by doing what they do best. They think their style helps them against the Warriors. And, you know, to their credit, it showed a little bit in the playoffs last season and during that huge regular season win after the All-Star break last year that they might be right. And uh, they obviously have not shown that in any capacity this year. I think they had a pretty close game uh, in their final regular season meeting. But did Durant play him? Yeah, I guess he played in all four. So, um, But it's going to take the Blazers playing at a very high level and Damian Lillard playing at a very high level um, – for them to be able to to, to hold or to uh, keep up with them and some luck too. They're oh yeah, get for lucky. sure. <laughs> I, mean, sure. I don't yeah. I don't know what that looks like. Yeah, but they're gonna have to they're gonna have to catch a, a couple breaks or yeah. a couple ten breaks. That is, I mean, perhaps the only two ideas or the only two ways that that it does. I don't I don't know what I'm trying to say, but they're the Blazers like to play like the Warriors. They like to play up and down. They like to play fast. They like to score. They like to shoot threes. I mean, that's sort of the NBA now. But uh, So they think that that helps them. Also, the Blazers, over the last couple of seasons, have had their best lineups with a small lineup, with a small ball, quote-unquote, lineup. So the Warriors like to play that way. Maybe the Blazers feel that plays into their hands. I, uh, they have been, and, and I think, uh, was it Mo I, that mentioned it last night about – about Noah Vonley and how he's been playing and how they can Switch. how switching at, at basically every position now is a possibility because Vonley has improved and is a guy who has been playing a bit more center lately in small lineups. I think they're going to play Al Farouk Aminu at center again, particularly in lineups where Draymond Green is playing center. Uh, so they can go that that route. They're not as good of, at it as the Warriors are, obviously, but but it's nice that they have that ability now. Uh, assuming again that that guys like Von Ley and Alfred Camino can stay out of foul trouble. Uh, it would also be nice if they could get something out of Myers in the series. Uh, you know, if he can pull Zaza or Draymond Green away from the rim, though Draymond's not really staying at the rim anyways. You know, you, you hope you can get something out of out of Myers in this series, particularly if Nurkic can't go, but, you know, yet to be seen. And, of course, the question that I get asked, I assume you get asked more than any other, is, is will Nurkic play? And then should he play? And and that's a very complicated issue, obviously. I know we talked at length, I think, in the last podcast about this. But, uh, again, he has done at least three light workouts that we've seen um, over the last week or so. And I know that he wants to play. I at least it seems like Absolutely. he wants to play. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's no doubt that if if it was just up to, to Yusuf, he, he'd be playing. And then you get to the, to the point of, is it a team's obligation to sometimes calm a, a guy down and make him not play for his best interests? And uh, I sort of wrote about this today uh, without uh, – hopefully without giving my opinion on the matter. But, um, you know, you look at this history of this franchise. Obviously, the centers speak for themselves. But let's not forget that Brandon Roy might have a little something to say about this too. Yeah. He came back in that epic, uh, you know, uh, triumphant return in 2010 against the Suns in Game 4 uh, – Sort of his the emotion of that led them to a victory. Uh, 
they went on to lose the next two games, lost the series in six. And he was never the same player again after returning just, I think it was eight days after knee yeah, surgery. Not long. Yeah, it was crazy. Now, again, a knee is not the same as a, a chip in a leg or a, or a fracture in his leg. I don't understand what's going on with his leg. A non-displaced fracture in his fibular bone. Uh, and as we said last time, we're not doctors. And even if we were, we don't have access to his medical records. So you'd like to think that the Blazers will make the best decision with him for the long-term future uh, uh, in his long-term health. You just hope that they use caution, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, for me, it's if the doctors say, hey, it's completely healed, he plays. If the doctors say, hey, it's healed up somewhat but not all the way and you could still re-injure it, I would hope that at that point they would sit him down. Uh, I, if there's any chance of exacerbating the injury or re-aggravating the injury, I, do, I just don't think you can play. And, and I know that he's going to want to, even if that is the case, but I, I do think you have to worry about the, or you have to put the concern, the long-term health of the player and of the franchise for that matter as well, uh, above, you know, winning a, a playoff series. Now I've been around for long enough and around enough different coaches and general managers and just with the organization to know that you know particularly during playoff time sometimes you're not thinking as clearly maybe as you should and you make decisions based off of factors other than maybe what is best I don't think that's the situation in this case I and I think that particularly being in the 1-8 against a team like the Warriors I I my assumption is that they're going to play it cautious uh, and you know, I guess I would say I guess we'll see. But then even then, how would we really know? You know, like unless they're going to they're going to get a doctor up there or a third party and say, we've looked at this and he's fine and he can play and no one should be concerned about it. I guess we would never really know for sure. Unless he says, I mean, he's a pretty open guy when he when he wants to be. So he could say, look, I really want to play, but the doctors advise against it or the, bla you know. Well, no, if, I mean, if he doesn't play, then we'll know. Yeah. You oh, know, like if yeah, yeah. I, I'm just saying if, if he does play you would hope that they make that decision based off of the advice almost strictly of the medical staff, which, again, I would assume they will yeah. because I, I just don't see them putting anyone's health in jeopardy to to try to get out of the first round. This yeah, year. and I really believe, and we've talked about this, so I'll be brief, but they have found a guy who's a cornerstone of their franchise. Yeah. It's only been 20 games, but the impact that he makes on both ends of the court – and how he just compliments Dame and CJ and opens up the court for them so much and then kind of allows everybody else to fill the role that they need to fill. The Blazers found their guy. And, and I think, in a sense, you are Blazers fans, you already won because you landed him out of the blue with a first-round draft pick. Why risk it all in a series in which, as so many odds makers have said, you, you have a long shot at winning? I I think the risk does not outweigh the potential reward in this case. But again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't. If his leg's fine, he's gonna play. Yeah. If if, if it's if if it's healthy, he's got no pain, and and the doctors say, yeah, you're fine, no worries, then go for it. And and again, I don't know if it's one of those injuries where they could say, look, yes, it's not healed, but you are not going to make it any worse. If it's one of those things, I mean, Lamarcus playing with you know basically without the tendon in his thumb for the last 20 games and the playoffs whatever that was two years back. I mean, it was that situation. They're like, look, it's not healed. It's not going to be healed, but you're not going to make it any worse by playing. So we played. Yeah. It's thumbs different than a leg. No, and, and I, I'm just using that as the example. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, for me, it would be hard to imagine how if a leg was still fractured, it couldn't fracture worse if you were playing on it. But again, I, I have to at least be open to that possibility because, I don't know, I'm just some idiot who writes words on the Internet. <laughs> you got half of that right. I'll let the listeners decide which half you got right. Um, the Internet's right here, Joe. I write on it all the time. I know. So that's I was giving you a compliment. I know. I was that's playing a straight man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we answered questions. We have a, we had a lot of nerd questions, so we'll just tackle these really quickly here. I think we answered Michael VIP Lowry's. We answered... Keenan Montgomery's, and we answered Deloitte's, um, and we answered Tyler Stobes, I believe. A couple Thanks different for the question, guys. Yes, thank you. A couple more Nurkic questions from these fine folks. Brandon Goldner wants to know, agree or disagree, Nurkic won't take long to settle in if and when he returns. Seems like he gelled with the team pretty quickly. I would agree. I would that. agree, too. I do wonder about his, his shape. He's been out for two weeks. Yeah. 
There's only so much I would think you can do uh, conditioning wise with a fracture in your I would leg. I assume that as well. So there might be something to monitor there. But as we saw, he was an immediate, uh, had an immediate chemistry with this team. And especially after playing 20, 20 games, that, that, familiarity that he didn't lack to then in which he played so well he has now so you would think that it would be an immediate immediate sinking and with what they utilize Yusuf to do particularly on the offensive end at least initially I mean you know I'm gonna dump the ball to you Yusuf do go, your thing. go to work I mean that's the, the you don't need to get used to that I I, I think if he's able to play I, I think I, I agree. I think conditioning would be more of an issue than his actual fit in the team right now. Uh, from Jared Cowley, if Nurkic isn't ready to go, do you think Stotts would start Myers, or do you think he would go small with a small ball starting lineup against Golden State? I think he goes small. I think you start Aminu and Noah. I think if if Zaza is starting, I think you start Myers. And as soon as Zaza goes out, I think you put Aminu in that power forward and put or at power forward or center and alongside Vonley. I think the reason I said you go small, and I didn't think about the bench matchup, so I didn't even factor that in, is I think Aminu can guard Zaza in his sleep because Aminu has proven that he can guard bigger guys, and he showed it against Blake Griffin last s series and a lot this, this season. He guards bigs a lot better than he gets credit for. In fact, he proved me wrong going into that series last year. And so I think he can handle Zaza. No, I, I, I think he can too. Yeah. My, my my worry would be early foul trouble for Al Farouk uh, because you're, you're going to need him out there for the entire game. And if you go out and you start him on Zaza and he picks up a cheap one on Zaza, one or two, I, I think those are fouls that Myers could be giving. You know, I just, I, I just feel like you need to make sure you're preserving those guys and any, any opportunity you have to, to pull off even five or six minutes, I, I think you, you – you need to do because I, I think uh, particularly with as you know as short as they are on, on bigs right now if Nurkic can't play I mean they're they're going to need those guys to play and I, I think you you look for places where you can play them where you know it, it mitigates the the things that they're not able to do as well and again I, I think kind of getting into the flow of the game and putting Myers out there and letting him body on Zaza and if they go at Myers then they go at him and that's that if Myers can pull Zaza out one or two times early in the game before you, you turn it over to smart lineups, that works too. I, I just think that I think you need to get something out of out of your more traditional bigs. It doesn't have to be a whole lot, but it's got to be something. One thing about the playoffs is the rotation tends to shrink. Absolutely. And I don't think Myers is ready to uh, to face the Warriors in the playoffs. Hmm. And Interesting. I think your best lineup gives you your best chance, and I think that is Aminu with, with the four other starters at this point. Assuming that Nurkic doesn't play. This is assuming Nurkic yeah. doesn't play, of course. And Myers is just as likely to pick up two early fouls as Aminu is. Well, right, but what, I mean, what I'm saying is, but that's okay, you know, because you're, Aminu is much more important to their chances of beating the Warriors than, than Myers is. I mean, that's just, that's certifiable. So, and, and that's kind of my, my point is that, yeah, he, he's just as, as likely to do that, but that's okay. Like, you, if, if Aminu has three fouls in the first quarter, that's your ball game. That's yeah. tough sledding for the Blazers. I mean, it's going to be hard either way, but that's that makes it really tough. So, what if you? Okay, so what if you go your route and then you get down twenty? Well, it, it, you, you might as well you throw your best lineup out there. No, I, I, well, and I, I'm not saying you don't get to those that lineup quickly. Soon, I'm just saying you try to see if you can how many minutes you can it. eat with with having a, a more traditional center slash power forward and Myers out there before you turn it over to. Aminu and, and Vonley and, and Heartless. Yeah. yeah. There you go, Jared. Some general uh, disagreement there. So uh, I don't know. That, well, that's, we'll, we'll know. We'll, we'll see how he plays it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Any more Nurkic questions? I think we I think we got them all. Yeah, let's go. All that's right. Not. So should we get to the other questions? Yeah. All right. Uh, as always, questions. We ask them on Twitter, at Blazer Freeman, at Seahold. Follow us, and then you can have a chance to uh, ask any questions you might have. First up from Armando Munoz, how much are tickets for the first round? You know, I don't know how much playoff tickets I are. I have no idea. They vary widely. Uh, you should visit trailblazers.com uh, to get your uh, your ticket information or visit the box office. Let's see if I can get a, get a handle on that. Playoffs. Well, he uh, digs that up really quickly. Micah wants to know, if you're Terry Stotts, who do you put on Kevin Durant? Good question, Micah. I think it, it has to be some combination of Mo or Aminu. I think Aminu would defend him the best, but if you're going to need Aminu to guard a big, um, maybe you don't go that route, and then who guards Draymond? 
So, <laughs> which I guess would be Noah. So I, you start off with, with Mo is, is how you start off. And then as the game goes, you adjust with Amino slash Mo. That's, that's what I would do. Uh, to answer your question here, uh, for game one, as of right now on Trailblazers.com, uh, 100 level tickets are as low as $113, which is actually pretty good. Yeah, it is. Uh, 200 level tickets as low as $71. 300 level tickets as low as $25. Hmm. So there you go. Boy, they did not sell out immediately. Yeah, well, especially when you're playing game three, it, that's not all that uncommon. And you don't want to sell out immediately, actually. Really? Yeah, no. If you want to maximize profit, you want to sell out basically right before the game starts. Oh, because, because if you sell out expensive. too quickly, that means you price your tickets too low. At least that is the analytical approach to setting ticket prices. Now, I know fans out there will probably say you want the building full, so tickets should be cheap, and people don't like to spend a lot of money on tickets because who wants to spend more money than they have to? But from a again, from a, from a maximizing profit perspective, the idea is to just barely sell out. Okay, C.J. Anderson wants to know, what is more likely, that the Blazers score 50 points in a quarter or the Blazers hold the Warriors under 15 in a quarter? Blazers score 50 points in a quarter, yeah. <laughs> I would say. Yeah, hold, holding Gold State under 15, uh, pretty unlikely. I mean, it, it can happen. I just, I, 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 if they only score 15 points in a quarter, I'm guessing it had more to do with the Golden State Warriors than it did the Trail Blazers defense. Uh, I will say that neither of those things are at all likely, and neither no, will happen, but it's more likely for the Blazers to score 50. Uh, from 40 Blasters, for the Blazers to make it a series, we need X-Factor players. Who do you think will make big impacts on offense, defense, who steps up? So essentially, we should give our X-Factor for the series. Okay. Uh, my X-Factor, um, you know, I'm going to go with Evan Turner. I think that... Uh, you know, Evan's kind of been so-so here as, he, as he's come back from his hand injury. Uh, I think it's an important series for Evan. I, I think that defensively he gives the Blazers something that they didn't have last year in this series. Um, and I think he played pretty well in that in the final game versus the Warriors. Uh, missed the shot that, that would have won the game. But the fact that he took it, I, I think, is a, is a good sign for the Trail Blazers. So I'm going to go with, uh, with one Evan Turner. We go from disagreeing to agreeing. I also think Evan Turner See, is the expert. I would X-Factor. rather have disagreed there. Though. I know, but it. we didn't even talk about this beforehand. No, this we is didn't. Just how actually. we are, uh, and not for all the reasons that you said, but also Evan is a guy who has uh, extensive playoff experience. As I said, he was a part of an eight beating a one uh, at, during his second year in the NBA. He was on some very good teams in Philly before they they went in their tank mode. And he was on some good teams in Boston, too. So he has playoff experience, which always helps in this sort of a situation. And he's going to be in a bench role, uh, a guy who can uh, conceivably add a, another ball handler, which is what the Blazers thought they lacked in the playoffs last year. Uh, so that combination of experience and ball handling um, – and, and then just in that backup role against some of the Warriors' backups, I think he's a guy who can perhaps make an impact uh, in that setting. Next up from Nick Burnett, which Blazer player or z-ers, players could help themselves the most going forward with a strong showing in the playoffs? Evan Turner, question mark? Noah Vonley, question mark? Uh, well, uh, if by helping themselves you mean improving their chances of getting a good contract next time around, I would say Noah Vonley. Uh, you know, and particular, and just in the in the more general sense too, uh, I feel like Noah is kind of seems like he's starting to take that to kind of get the, to that point where yeah, he's becoming a more consistent performer. I think having a, a good showing against a very good team in the Warriors, particularly against a guy like Draymond Green, who I think if you're a Trailblazer fan, your your dream for Noah Vonley is to someday become some kind of Draymond Green light kind of prospect then I, I would say yeah he he has probably the the most to gain by having a a good showing of versus the warriors yeah uh him i think evan turner for turner, what, reasons absolutely. we just talked yeah. about um contract wise almost all these guys are set contract well and that's so, why yeah I, yeah I, I would say mo as well like if mo can come out and have a good defensive sure. series uh you know kind of really solidify himself as a a quality wing defender i i think that uh that makes Blazer fans, I feel, like better going forward. Not only about the contract, which I think is is a perfectly fair contract for yeah. Mo, by the way, um, but also just for having someone established at that three slash four role. I and I really think at this point Mo is is a is a straight three. So yeah. Um, so I think going forward, you you feel better about this team's prospects if 
I mean, Noah Vonley and, to a lesser extent, Mo Harkless both had good series. I think Noah has sort of, as you said, emerged over the last... I mean, he had 19 rebounds last night. Uh, he's emerged over the last month, three to four weeks. So I think no matter how he does in the playoffs, y- you'll sort of have at least seen what he can do, particularly playing with or alongside Nurkic. So that gives you optimism about his role. Uh, it would help him if he didn't uh, fall on his face in the playoffs. That would give you more confidence. But I think Evan Turner has the most to gain and lose in this series. He has uh, not been the impact player that he was supposed to be in Portland. And he can sort of redeem all of that with a big series, I think. Or a redeem might not be the right word, but put to rest a lot of those concerns with a big series. So I'm going to go Evan Turner again. And his uh, his buddy Andre Iguodala being on the other side there, maybe a little... Uh, motivation? Exactly, a little motivation. Give yourself an opportunity to, to maybe talk some trash if you're able to go out there and play well. And keep yourself from getting dogged relentlessly if you go out there and lay an egg. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think he needs any extra reason to, to talk trash. He likes to talk no, trash. No, no, not at all. Uh, Corbin wants to know, what Deep Space Nine character is every person in the series? Corbin's the guy who asks questions that he already knows the answer to, uh, to in the hopes that you will mention how smart he is. So there you go, Corbin. You're smart. I, I, I don't know that I've ever actually seen an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I couldn't name a character. Uh, my dad, I believe, was into that for a while, but I never I never um, watched that. So There was some dude with a weird-looking face who had a bar or something. Well, oh, yeah, he is a Ferengi, I think. Sure. Um, yeah, well, with the ears, right? Yeah. 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 I is that know. Deep Space Nine? I, I I can never tell if that or Next Generation. I mean, I, I get those mixed up. I think up. it was Deep Space Nine. Yeah. But I, I haven't. That's the one with the wormhole or whatever, I right? I don't know. I don't like know. Like a circle spaceship that you shoot through? Sure. I'll say yes. You sound confident. Or uh, no, you sound no, like you have kind of an idea. Yeah. <laughs> a, a, a loose idea. And and really, probably most of this is just from having followed Corbin on, on Twitter. So there you there go. There you go. Next up from Ben Cron, thanks for the pods. You are welcome, Ben. Thank you for listening. If Noah struggles during the series, do you see the Blazers starting Aminu at the four in later games? Could be. I yeah, mean, adjustments. I that. Yeah, yeah, every series is rife for adjustments. When you get down and you get your back against the wall, it, it's every, anything's up for grabs. So, sure. Um, my, my one, I mean, it, it is about adjustments, but also, I mean, as, as we've talked about in, in the playoffs prior, you also have to guard yourself from – Overcompensating? From, exactly. From making changes based off of one game, which is why I think you're more likely to see tweaks in a game three than you would in a game two, even if the Blazers come out and get boat raced in, in game one. So, uh, you know, you do have to, to make sure that you're not overreacting to things that happened in, in one game. In some respects, you got to stick to your plan. If that's the plan you think is going to win for you, if it doesn't work the first time, doesn't mean you, you, you scrap it and go with something else. But I do think that, particularly if a guy is having a hard time, I could see Terry going with with a lineup change. And and to be perfectly honest, too, I would even go as far as to say I would be surprised if Alfred Camino didn't start a game in the playoffs. Yeah, and I mean, I just, after, if the Blazers lose and lose big in game one, the most popular question we are going to get on our in-between game one and game two podcasts is what type of... The, Adjustments do the Blazers need to make to to get to game two? Sometimes you're just outmanned, and and you're just simply not as good of a team. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen in this series. Most people seem to think the Blazers are going to get beat in four or five games. I tend to agree with them. I don't know that there's any magical adjustment that you can make to change this series around uh, should you get down. Uh, again, there's matchup problems all over the court for the Warriors. So... Um, I guess I need to get into the playoffs before I I can you know speculate on what type of adjustments need to be made. Yeah. But um, yeah, so there you go. Thanks for listening, Ben. Next up from Rip City Revival, are you guys more excited for this first round matchup than last year's against the Clippers? Um, I can answer no. I'm not. I there was more uh, mystery to last year's playoffs. Uh, it. It was a four versus a five. I think most people thought it was going to be one of the more competitive first round series. We certainly weren't talking about, uh, you know, uh, prognosticators speculating that the Blazers had a less than one percent chance at winning the series. Uh, there was general dislike and hate between the teams last year. I think there's dislike, but more mutual respect uh, among these these two teams. Um, and we just did this. 
We just watched this series last year. That's true. Yeah. So I, I guess on a, I don't know. I, I hate Los. I just hate Los Angeles. I don't like the city. I don't like covering games at Staples particularly. So in that, I mean, I don't love covering games at Oracle either. But it's a, it's always a great crowd at least. So I don't know. I. I, I'm I'm less optimistic about Portland's chances this time for sure, but I, I can't say that I'm I'm less excited for the series this time. I I mean I, I think you know playing a team like the Warriors who have two MVPs and and All Stars up and down the roster. I don't know. I think that's I think that's fun. I, and I like watching games at Oracle uh, again with the crowd, uh, the security staff. I, I feel like I've been there enough times now to where hopefully they recognize me enough to not try to strong arm me for ludicrous reasons but uh i guess we'll see in game one you know what you are excited for what's that joe is that a chance is that the well that's a, is that a different one yeah it must be yeah because you flubbed that joe yeah what the heck <laughs> you know what that's it's the same group <laughs> well of course it's the same group two Weird. three Here we go. Uh, Now this this song for me is always tainted now though because right after this song came out is when they're like oh yeah Nurkic's leg is broken. So some might claim that the song was uh, in some ways responsible for like a a, 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 a bad luck exactly song. you know like the tempting the fates by uh, by actually being happy about a player that you got in trade, particularly a center which you know in Portland there's no. Uh, <laughs> There's no precaution that's too great in uh, in keeping your centers healthy. But don't you think this will just inspire him to come back? And probably. That's probably what the when they do that therapy where they you know like they take like they they try to uh, stimulate the bone growth by by putting that wand over it. They're yeah. probably actually running the waveform of that song. Or he's through. just had headphones listening to that exactly. while he's getting wanded. He always, he I, and I I've I've been meaning to do this, but I, I keep forgetting. And I don't like to screenshot stuff because I know that players sometimes get annoyed by it. But he posts stuff in in Serbian that I don't understand on particularly on uh, on Instagram Live all the time. And I'm always curious if he's like trying to send messages by things that he's posting in other languages. So one of these days, I'm gonna actually stop and screenshot and then have our our Serbian folks here in the office translate for me. I'll so be interested to hear what that, how that goes. Next up from Ronnie Stewart, what are your top five Blazer games of the season? Boy, I don't know if I have a top five. That's tough. It was a, it was a very weird season. Uh, my top five are for different reasons, probably. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, Joe's like, which games were the shortest? Yeah. <laughs> uh, which games uh, provided the the most uh, choice storylines? Yeah, I don't. I mean, if you're just talking hmm. about, like, if I were a Blazers fan, you know, what type of, I mean, what were the most impressive victories or, or what, you know, that sort of a thing. I mean, I think you have to look at that Nurkic. Uh, a couple of them would involve Nurkic. The the revenge game against Denver was Yeah, the was Denver fun. game is definitely on, uh, on the top five. Yeah, for sure. and that was, you know, a point where, you know, I think it was a huge game for the Blazers, too, because they needed it for the playoffs. He had a huge game. It was... A rare time when a guy sticks it to his former team like that. Um, his debut ge- or his blow up game against the 76ers when he went berserk for the first time. That was a fun game. Um, the uh, I think one of the games that sticks out to me too is March 7th at Oklahoma City that the Blazers won 126 121. Russell Westbrook had 58 points. Uh, beating the Thunder in Oklahoma City with Westbrook having a really good game, I, I think. I think that says a lot about the Trailblazers. I thought that was a, a pretty good win. Uh, Damian win, scoring fifty nine. Yeah. I don't know if I'd, I don't know if I put that as a top five game, but it, obviously when you see a guy break the franchise record in scoring in a game, I mean that's that's something. The win at Chicago on December fifth got the Blazers to twelve and ten. It was a big road win. They were at the start of a of a long trip, and uh, there were certainly some people behind the scenes who thought that. Everything was coming together, and they were about to take off. Then that obviously didn't happen, but that was that was a memorable game. the The road trip that they uh, they won four out of five on, though obviously I don't know if I put any of these single games. Though the Spurs game, I, I thought in San Antonio, uh, a very good game for the Trailblazers. Well, and Dame also scored had a fifty burger or forty nine or whatever it was at Miami too. Yeah, that was a, on a second game of a back to back. That was pretty ridiculous. Yeah, that that whole trip I thought was a was one of my. I mean, it, it was one of my favorite trips probably in the last couple of years, just with how well the team played and 
the way it worked out, even though we were in Atlanta for like five days. Yeah, that worked out for me because my uh, sisters, I was able to. That's see right, them. and Joe got to got to see family. Yeah. So there you go. That, another thing that uh. See, that's how I would rate my trips. Yeah. Is, yeah. Okay. Next up from Levi Loss. Now that all the games are done, when do we find out who wins the draft position coin flips? That's a good question. I actually don't know. I don't know when they do coin flips. Yeah, I know it's it's, it's, it's down pretty. The road. I think they they might just do it at the same time they do the lottery. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe. they just settle the coin flips then. Yeah. To be honest with you, Levi, I don't know. Yeah, the Blazers, since you ask, and I did have it pulled up since we didn't do our usual update, uh, the Blazers are tied for seven for the seventeenth pick with the Chicago Bulls. They're also tied at 41, 41 with the Heat, but since the Heat didn't make the playoffs, they I believe they automatically get the better pick. So there needs to be a coin flip to decide who gets the pick between who gets the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15th or 16th pick between the Trailblazers and the Bulls. Then there will need to be a tie break between the Hawks and the Grizzlies to decide if the Blazers get the 19. 19th or 20th pick. And then there is a one, two, three, four-way tie at 51 and 31. For 23. For for 23rd, which is the Cleveland Cavaliers pick. So every single pick the Blazers have is to be determined by coin flip still. Next and I up, assume they do coin flip for four-way tie. I don't know how that works, but I'm, I know they've got system. the process yeah. in place. Yeah. Next up from Miko Valtonen. Thanks for the great pod. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. Myself and my sons are huge Blazer fans from Finland. Hey, nice job. Who's going to have better point per game after the goal? So who's going to have a higher points per game average after the series, Dame or Stephen Curry? I'm going to say Dame. Dame. Yeah, I think it'll be Dame because, I mean, he he's going to have to score a lot, and he's got a lot less help than Stephen Curry, yeah. obviously. Um, no offense to anyone on the team. I'm well, yeah, I mean, there's not four all-stars on the Blazers team currently. No, yeah. or one. Or any – there is – I was looking at – I don't think anyone on the Blazers is going to get any kind of postseason award. You know, I was been doing some research for my own postseason voting, which, by the way, I have no idea who I'm going to vote for MVP, and I have to submit my ballots tomorrow. Uh, well, I mean, I have an idea, but I go back. Why don't you turn it over to the Rip City Report listeners, Joe? All right, you guys, you've got um, 24 hours to weigh in on who I should vote for Inundate MVP. Inundate Joe's Twitter account with uh, – and, and make sure you mention that you heard it on the Rip City Report. Joe, Joe will abide. He'll, he'll give you a cut of his vote. How about that? Sure, I will. Or you can go all the way. It's it's all serious here. If I get a uh, a ton of votes or a ton of suggestions, and it's it's clear that one guy is getting more votes, then I I mean I will take that into account for sure. So there you go. Yeah, I mean it's it's clearly down to James Harden, Russell Westbrook, or Kawhi Leonard in my opinion. LeBron is in my my top five ballot. And then the fifth guy is like, do you vote for Isaiah Thomas? The, the Boston finished first in the East. I think he probably deserves some credit for that. You've got Giannis Antetokounmpo, whatever. I, I'm sorry I pronounced your name incorrectly. He's had a fine season. So, you know, uh, but again, I think those those first three guys are, are the, the main contender. So weigh in. I, I would love to hear what you need to think or yeah. what you think. Uh, yeah, so I think we both think Dame. Next up from Jordan, does the NBA need to get rid of conferences? Is it fair that the Cavaliers would be a possible six seed in the West, but a two in the East? No, I don't think you should get rid of conferences because there's already enough travel as is in the NBA. You're never going to be able to play a, an even schedule with just how how large the United States is and how far it is to go from Portland to Boston or Miami or New York and do that more than once. I, I think conferences work just fine. I I just feel, I feel like there's so many things in the NBA right now where it's like it's a very popular sport. The NBA just released that they broke records for attendance this year. And like there's always just this nitpicking about, oh, well, they could do this better or that better. It's like at a certain point, it's like I don't care. Yeah. Like I, I think this is a great sport as it is. Having conferences, which every single sport has, what's the big deal? Uh, I, I Well, I guess soccer doesn't have it, but. I mean, Cleveland was not – they wouldn't have been as high a seed in the West last year either, and they won the championship. It isn't necessarily a reflection, uh, you know, of how good of a team you are. Uh, but, yeah, I agree with you. You have to have some type of, of, of separation geographically, geographically just for travel. Um, and, you know, the one thing I would change going change – in disagreeing with with your point is is the amount of games. I don't think we need two games, and we've yeah, talked about I, that. Yeah, I, I, and you know, I again, if people want to take less money, then okay. And and I, I guess I wouldn't. 
I just this idea that like they need to drop the season to fifty games or something like that, and teams won't rest guys if there's only two games a week. BS. Teams will still rest guys if there's fifty games. They'll rest guys if there's thirty games because you all you don't change the ratio at that point. You just change the the total numbers. So, you know, if, if they dropped it down, which I mean. <laughs> David, uh, excuse me, not David Silver, Adam Silver came out the other day and said pretty much there's been no discussion whatsoever of, of dropping to a to a smaller amount, which, by the way, too, I mean, all these contracts, particularly a television contract is a 10 year running contract. You just can't go in year three and be like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to play way fewer games now. So uh, please give us the same amount of money, but we're going to give you less product. Um, I, I again, I don't I don't really see a need to shorten the season, but I guess I don't hate the idea as much as I did a year ago. But. I'm getting sick of reading all these stories about how the NBA should change everything because there's some number that says that they're supposed to. Listen, Casey, we live in 2017 and everybody needs to have an opinion about everything. And some people need and to it's my talk. fault, too. I should stop reading it. You know, that's on me. That's, that, true. That, that's my fault. So I, I shouldn't put that on anyone else. I, if I get tired of reading stories about those things, I, I should just stop reading them. Yeah. That said, it was a good question. It was, it's not a great question. Great question. Yeah. No, yeah. A- absolutely. Uh, next up from Zach, not related to the series, but do you think Pat Connaughton has a future in Portland? Uh, sure. You know, I, I think that he's still a, a fringe NBA guy right now, probably, and I don't know that he's going to have a whole lot. Well, actually, I guess i got to change my, my answer. I, I have a hard time seeing how Pat's going to get extended minutes in Portland with Damian and CJ and Alan, Alan Crabb and Evan, Evan Turner. Turner. But you never know. I think I think Pat can play, uh, it, just like a lot of guys in the NBA. Who you know, it's it's about getting your opportunity. I mean, heck, we saw Tim Frazier in here last night, and Will Barton. He's a guy who you know was was in uh, was in the D League, and now he's he's playing starter minutes in the NBA. So I mean, a lot of it's just opportunity. And I think if Pat if Pat gets an opportunity, he will be able to play. I I just don't know he'll get that opportunity in Portland. Uh, next up from Deloitte's, uh, he had a question about Nurkic, which I believe we answered. He also had a question about food halls. Do we like them? Pine, you know, like Pine Street Market, that sort of a thing. Should there be more in Portland? I did go. To, I've only been to, I think it was Pine Street Market once. And it was it was good. I, I was actually pleasantly surprised. It's a little too packed for me. Um, but no, it, it's good. I don't think we probably need more of them. I think they did just open a new one uh, they did. the other day. Um, what did you have there? I had the uh, I had the rotisserie chicken at the rotisserie chicken place. It's not called rotisserie chicken. I think it used to be... Uh, I think it it was a uh, Toro Bravo offshoot that they then disassociated from Toro Bravo. I can't remember what it's called now, but long story short, it was chicken with sauces on it, and it was fantastic. Good. Is that uh, Pollo Bravo? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Sure. We actually went because we were going to go to Whizbang, but the line was too long. Oh so. yeah, I uh, have been there. I had the Moroccan ramen, which is which is good. Um, I think there should be more uh, markets, but I'd like to see them. Not in downtown or yeah, the downtown exactly. area because and I don't ever go I don't downtown. Ever go to downtown? Yeah, that, so I was just thinking that the other day. I was like, I, it doesn't matter what you put there. I'm not going into downtown. I Portland. do get it why they're there though because that's where a lot of tourists yeah, go no, and that's where sense. a lot of people who work downtown yeah. go. So I, I do understand that, um, but I'd like to see them dispersed out, and I would I would like to see more. Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, let's see. Next up from boy, I'm, I lost my place here. I apologize. From Rafa, for the Blazers to stand a chance against the Warriors, do we need to focus? What do we need to focus on in terms of limiting their production in the series? So, who do the Blazers need to focus on in terms of limiting their production in the series? Man, the Warriors have too many weapons, yeah. Rafa. You can't focus on one guy. If you try to take out Durant, you've got Steph killing you. If you try to take out Steph, you've got Durant and uh, uh, Clay killing you. Then you've got Draymond there all the while with the triple double waiting to happen. You just have to play stout, solid, uh, sturdy team defense and, and hope for the best and that's try to outscore right. him. And that's what the Blazers are going to try to do. They're going to try to outscore him, quite frankly. I'd agree. And, and, but I guess if I was going to answer, I'd say you try to take away, I'd say maybe Clay, just because, you know, if you, if you can take out one of those guys, he's probably the, the most likely to, though he's such a great complimentary player that, God, it, he's the guy that teams leave to, to go get Steph or KD, and then he just eats, so... He was yeah, fantastic that, last year. Yeah, no, he's, he's, a, he's a really good player. A couple more uh, from Darby Marioth. When Portland signed Evan Turner, I saw him as a solution for Golden State in their defense, which focused on shutting down the off-ball guard, Dame or CJ. I believe Turner could be that third ball handler on the team, a top-of-the-key distributor, facilitator for Dame, CJ. Thoughts on this? 
Well, that certainly is why they signed him. He's a ball handler. I don't know that Evans a distributor just yet. You know, he it's, he he dribbles, but it's again. I, I and and I'm not saying this negatively because I think he he's figured out that that he's maybe better to to focus on getting his own shot first and then create out of those opportunities rather than looking to be a stereotypical NBA point guard first and then get his get his own when he can. I think that Turner's better when he's being aggressive and looking for his shot and then creating off of that. Yeah, and in hindsight, it makes sense, but uh, him and CJ need the ball a lot. Yeah. They, they both dribble a lot, and so them together has has not worked out, I think, as the Blazers had hoped, and it, it's and even though we're a series or a season deep, they're still sort of working through that. So um, in theory, yes, you need that other ball handler to take pressure off Dame and CJ. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Evan can – can evolve even more and, and kind of be that guy. Uh, next up from John Ragel, which Blazer reserve equals best suited to get under Draymond Green's skin and draw him into an ejection? Parentheses, not promoting this illegal but brilliant strategy. Uh, and here are his choices. Pat Soda Pop Planet. Oh, so <laughs> Connaughton. Pat Soda Pop Connaughton. Jake the Snake Layman. Myers Punch My Shorts Leonard. Ed Davis on crutches. And I don't know, Cody. Oh, that's a different question. I'd, I'd take Ed Davis on crutches in that one, probably. He can throw the crutches at him. But I think Myers gets under everyone's skin in the NBA. I mean, just look at Boogie Cousins, yeah, but for it's, example. It seems to be, but it seems to result in good play for those players rather than... Yeah, fair. But it doesn't take much to get Draymond into an, a possible ejection. No. They're not going to do it. They're not going to eject Draymond. There's no chance. Didn't they actually do that in the finals? Well, last they year they the... had to kick him out of games because he kept kicking people in the in the testicles. But I mean, they didn't kick him out of any of the games when the games were going on. Trust me, they they they're not kicking Draymond Green out of this series. He he's going to have free reign to kick people as much as he wants. I think it was mostly a ton and quick cheek question for I John agree. anyway because Draymond's a little cuckoo. Yeah. Though I uh, so <laughs> if Yusuf Nurkic does play, do you think that there will be any targeting of that leg? Uh, I'm going to say no. That's that's very uh, big of me. Well, no, uh, diplomatic. What's a Pollyanna? Oh, uh, naive. Yeah, I'll say naive. Okay. Next up from Stephen R. Congrats on 100. Thanks, Stephen. I uh, we appreciate it. I've listened to about 70 or so. Well, that's impressive. That's great. I haven't listened to that many. (laughs) I don't even know that I was here for that many. Can you spend some time reflecting on the first 100? Also, thoughts looking into the future of the podcast. Mm. No. By, while, Casey, <laughs> while Casey thinks, I would like to give a shout out to Tim Underwood, who sent a nice email today, sending me a compilation of uh, a few, or the evolution of the introduction to the show. That was very nice of you, Tim. And Tim says he's listened to all 100, so kudos to you. It, people like you are the reason that we are sitting here right now. Um, maybe yeah, we'll, 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 we'll go over this we'll more when this. we, yeah, yeah, exactly. When when we get to our off-season celebration stuff, we'll do yeah. that, but um I just, in general, again, like just with the nature of this job, like I just have a hard time remembering <laughs> kind of things that happened in this year, or did they happen last year, or three years ago, or Blends together. was that a fabrication? Like it just, it's I I should keep a diary or a journal or something. But. Well, it's also like the lives we live with the travel and stuff. It really is much like Fight Club, where you're living in this perpetual state of whatever dimension that is. Sure, you know, are you awake or are you asleep? Are asleep, awake or asleep? Sure, that works. Awake or asleep? I don't know what you're doing here, Joe. I don't know either. Next question. (laughs) That's it. Oh, that's it. That's it. Okay. Thanks for listening, as always. Enjoy the playoffs. We will be, uh, as we did last year, we're going to try to bring you a podcast in between every... Not even try. We are going to. We are going to do it. Take take that qualifier out, Joe. We did it last year. We did do it last year, which is why we're going to do it again this year. All right. The NBA certainly has helped out with two days off in between. No, we could could do like a 24-hour podcast in between games and still have another 78 hours before the next game. So So we will talk to you after game one, before game two. Enjoy enjoy game one and the build-up to it. We'll talk to you then. Are you ready? How serious you trying to take us? No kidding, it's the Blazers that we're blasting the Lakers. Force the tempo, 50 point lead by halftime. Watch for she Wallace keeps smashing the baseline. Go left, go right, 360 degrees. Here comes a paint, Kobe. Hipping and he's popping a three. Trying to catch him coming down the court. Bonzi Wells, what a handle. It's amazing what he do for the sport. Damon Stoudemire saves the day, a.k.a. Mighty Mouse. Gonna show all of you scrubs how to play. What a show, why the Lakers even want it with us, you know. No one's ready to deal with us.